Thanks for joining everybody. My name is Scott Whitlock. I'm the president of Flexware Innovation and I'm gonna to moderate today's session on digital transformation. Um, so happy to be joined by these panelists. I'll let them introduce themselves here in just a second. You've all seen them on the invite, but we've got folks from industry, manufacturing leaders, um, as well as Mark Beckman from Microsoft who interacts with a lot of manufacturing customers. So. Super excited to, to just have an open dialogue um, and push this notion of digital transformation forward and, and just uh, learn together. One of Flexware's core values is never stop learning. And uh, this is just part of our never stop learning journey. So a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we are recording this meeting. So um, if it's a word that we find some good value in it, we might put it back on the website. Um, and obviously um, as, as with all of these things, you know, this is a wide open forum. So um, don't share anything you don't feel comfortable sharing internal to your organization. Okay, uh, just a quick tech check here. Everybody see the screen and slide share, uh, uh, the uh, slideshow and move to the agenda slide. A couple thumbs up maybe. Yep. Yes. Good. All right, awesome. Well, um, we, we really want to get to the meat of it here, so we're going to do some quick introductions. I'm just going to briefly introduce Flexware, get a little introduction from each of our panelists, and they're going to give a little perspective from their uh, organizations and leadership, um, what, what their feelings on digital transformation are, and then uh, I'll start moderating the panel. Um, we have quite a few topics we can dive into, but then we want to leave plenty of time at the end uh, for just questions from the audience. and, and uh, they could even be answered by the panel or other, uh, other audience participants. We just wanna have a good open dialogue. So uh, that's kind of how the day is gonna go. Just a couple of slides on Flexware for those of you who may not be real familiar with our company, um, just some statistics on our company. Um, we are approaching a hundred people. Um, I'll show you a map here in just a second uh, where we serve our clients. And you know, one, one thing many of you know uh, from being close to the company, we're, we love being generous. We have a lot of initiatives throughout the year. We have a foundation. And uh, so we, we track the number of organizations that we interact with there. Um, here's the industries that we focus on. Again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but um, our, our core ones are listed. Um, and it, it's pretty broad, everything from life science and pharmaceutical med device to utilities. And um, being from Northern Indiana, we have um, a great team uh, uh, in our Valparaiso office that grew up in the metals industry. So pretty broad array of industries. Here's just the, the map I was referring to. So as you can see, center of gravity for us is the Midwest, um, headquartered in Fishers, Indiana. Um, a lot of the work branches out from there, but we serve really the plants of Fortune 1000 companies. And so we'll go wherever our customers ask us to go. And lots of times as we're rolling out these transformations, you know, we're rolling, in, we're rolling them into multiple plants and often even around the world. So I think this is really one of the last introduction slides and um, most of you are familiar with this. The cool thing about this, for, for Flexware anyway, we're about 60% Boilermakers um, and this model was founded at Purdue University and it was originally called the Purdue Reference Model. It's now been adopted by ISA um, and it is an international standards model called the ISA 95 model. And when we talk about what we do within manufacturing and digital uh, technologies, we typically pull this slide open. So just real quick to, and, and we'll talk, we'll use a lot of these terms today. So maybe just to level set everyone. Um, the level zero, this thing started out as a four level model, one, two, three, four, one being automation and PLCs. Um, and then going on up in ERP. And in the last few years, ISA has added this sensor level, level zero, which is really, as we think about IoT and IIoT, um, that's really where le level zero lives. Level one, still that automation layer, PLC layer, um, a lot of intelligent devices. Level two being HMI SCADA, um, human machine interface or supervisory control and data acquisition. Um, level three being MES or MOM, Manufacturing Operation Management Systems, and level four being ERP. Um, and for those of you who might be taking notes, we'll make this deck available to everybody afterwards. 
um, we'll just send it out to everybody who registered for the event. So you'll just you'll hear us talk about these different technologies. The other, the other thing I would probably add on here, it's not dictated, not, not shown uh, graphically, but this whole concept of IT and OT or, or information technology and the concept of operational technology, which in my mind kind of falls level three and below or maybe level two and below operational technology. And you'll see over on the right, um, networking, connectivity, integration, security. So this whole idea of industrial cyber, cyber security or ITOT security is getting much, much more uh, attention now. Okay, so that's the introduction to Flexware. And why don't we just go uh, in order on the screen here? So John, you're up. Everybody's just gonna give a brief introduction of who they are and maybe the journey that they're on or maybe in Mark's case that they see their customers on towards digital transformation. John? Perfect, thanks Scott. John Zelma, um, currently I am the uh, Global Manufacturing for IT Director at Cook Medical. I'm about 20 plus years uh, in the medical device manufacturing space, a lot of different transformational roles, um, and currently leading the charge uh, in Cook for digital transformation, specifically for manufacturing and kind of that um, uh, entry point of supply chain as well, not into distribution, but, but mostly on the manufacturing side. Uh, we are a global manufacturer, multiple manufacturing sites and DCs. Uh, so it's, it's quite an interesting and um, uh, laborious journey. Good, Ethan, Ethan Lane. Hey, thank you, Scott. Glad to be with you. Apologize to everyone in advance. I'm in a more public location than I expected due to family events. So I'm in a hotel lobby. So you might get a little noise. Um, I'm the CIO for uh, Glen Raven. Uh, Glen Raven is a, one of the oldest family owned businesses in the United States. It's over 140 years old. Um, it, we have uh, 41 locations in 17 countries. Uh, textile company, Sunbrella being our main man, uh, branded product. Uh, so heavy manufacturing textile industry. Uh, I've been the CIO with Naranda for um, five years. We also do a lot in the distribution space and e-commerce space. Um, prior to Glen Raven, I was uh, CIO for Naranda in Tennessee, which was a private equity carve out aluminum industry and then really cut my teeth for 18 years at Pfizer Pharmaceuticals at the plant floor level where really our relationship with Scott started. Um, did a lot of work uh, years ago and uh, have continued that relationship. So that's kind of the background of us. And uh, as we get into this, I'll talk a little bit more about what we do with uh, um, our Azure platform and data lake that we're establishing part of one of our key digital transformation initiatives. Great. Thanks a lot, Ethan. Alpin? Good afternoon, everyone. Scott, thank you for uh, inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, as it, the slide says, the technical services manager for the facility here in Lafayette, Indiana, where we at Caterpillar produce the large engine families. Um, been in the industry for a little over 20 years and a lot of roles supporting process engineering and quality. And so several years ago, we started kind of our digital transformation here at the Lafayette site, um, getting busy with uh, some of the manufacturing activities we have and being a 40 year old facility, um, the brownfield that we would like to call it is, is really a diverse array of colors. When you think of uh, the assets, the diversity of assets and the age of assets. And of course, with that comes the complexity. And so we've been slowly but steadily working towards uh, what I would consider a small connect, collect, analyze, and act uh, type of a strategy, which we'll talk about more uh, as the hour goes by. So thank you once again for having me. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities, Alpin. You made me plan, do, check, act. You know, there's a lot of similarities, those life cycle circles and these digital transformation initiatives as well, right? Same so, theory. Yep, Mark Beckman. Yeah, thanks, Scott. And thanks for uh, inviting Microsoft to participate in this. We always like to also hear what our customers are doing and what's top of mind for, for folks. I probably don't need to say a whole lot about Microsoft uh, because most everybody knows who we are, uh, but little known fact and people don't always think of us from the perspective of manufacturing. And we are every bit of a manufacturer. 
uh, with Xbox and our Surface devices and a few other things. Uh, my job at Microsoft is to really help tell some of those stories and how we're helping, uh, how we can help manufacturers much the same way that we've digitally transformed our manufacturing and other parts of our business. Uh, so my job is working with uh, you know, manufacturers uh, to share what's happening with Industry 4.0, smart manufacturing, however you want to craft that language, uh, what's happening in the supply chain, um, and really what's happening in the workforce. And uh, we've seen some interesting things happen from a digital transformation perspective, largely uh, accelerated by COVID. Um, and I'm sure I can share a few things uh, as we move through the conversation today on some uh, uh, stories there as well. Great, thanks, Mark. So I thought, even though we did a little pregame warm up on this panel, I'm gonna throw you guys a curveball and uh, just read something and have you react to it. Um, this is a, a MIT Sloan paper on digital transformation and the leading, uh, the lead off paragraph says leading a corporate transformation of any kind is difficult and it hasn't become easier or any easier over time. But starting and sustaining a digital transformation in manufacturing company, that's a tougher than managing any other change initiative from total quality management to Six Sigma to lean manufacturing. And they go on to say um, that there's really three forces of inertia against these types of initiatives. Um, and this is where I just love for the panel to chime in. The first one they identify as incumbency and I wrote in the margin, you know, it's the whirlwind we're in every day. It's just the day-to-day -day, uh, whirlwind. Talent, um, and I'll, I'll have some comments on that one just as we, you know, but the concept of, uh, you know, place, it's a, you know, one of the sub uh, sentences in here, unlike Alphabet and Apple companies like GE and Ford Motor aren't considered employers of choice for software engineers, right? So talent is an issue and culture. Um, and I think you probably tie culture pretty closely to talent. So in terms of just a way to kick it off today, everyone, you, you know, we, I, I want to hear if we all agree that those are some um, forces of inertia against getting these large initiatives started and maybe what you found in your own organizations that might also be challenges to, to getting some of these started and then also how you've overcome them. So anybody? I got, I, I, yeah, I can jump in there, Scott, because, um, you know, kind of in the midst of this right now with our transformation. And the, the first one I address is kind of the whirlwind. This is this has been my experience through all my transformational projects is it, it, it's extremely rare that you will ever get a dedicated team. Hey, guys, here's 12 to 15 people. Their full time job for the next three to five years is going to be nothing but change and, and, and introducing these systems and cleaning up that never happens. What happens is that it gets popped onto everybody's existing workload. And they're in, in addition to, you know, fighting fires of the day and whatnot, they're now responsible for carrying out a lot of this transformational activity. What is absolutely most important that I find, find uh, works very well is to really be strategic in your transformation and make sure that you're actually eliminating fires as you go to free up that human capital. So if I'm, if, if you look at typically the 80-20 rule applies, uh, for a manufacturing site, 20% of the SKUs make up 80% of your volume. And in that 80% of your volume is 80% of your fires. So if you can structure your, your adoption of this technology or this transformation uh, strategically, you could be eliminating 80% of the people's fire to free them up to continue on with the transformation as you go. If you don't, you will crush those people. And that's how you get the horror stories of the large ERP implementations that last years and years, because you're not actually eliminating any of that work. And people can carry that additional work for a, a, a given period of time, but uh, eventually they will crush under the weight if you're not eliminating those fires to free up that human capital. Um, the other is I'll, I'll just touch on is, is the talent. Absolutely. You, we have to invest in our people to develop that talent, to acquire these new technologies, but also to sustain them. However, most transformation projects don't have the luxury of lead time that is required to bring these people up to speed. And that's where I've found partnering with guys like you and your team and whatnot 
that have done this before and they can give you the watch out fors. They can give you the kind of heavy lifting that's required to get over that initial hump that then can can do the knowledge transfer to the local team and they can sustain it, right? And I and I very much equate that to uh, um, kind of enablement versus run teams where, okay, bring, br bring in a partner that has done this before, help us get over the hump and then let us kind of carry that torch. Yeah, and I'll, uh, let me maybe, dove, thanks, John. Let me jump off that. So we did a project for the Cat Lafayette plant that Alpen works out of in the early 2000s, and it was a traceability project. And you can imagine sometimes traceability projects are, you know, feel maybe a little bit like Big Brother. Alpen, I wonder if you might just jump off on maybe some stories where you've seen a culture or the talent change and maybe sure. part partnering you know, these digital transformation folks, or specialties or projects with your workforce and, and any good success stories there or how you're working on that? Yeah, so maybe, maybe just to build upon what John just socialized and, and thank you for being so astute with your commentary, John. You know, another thing that is really different about the digital transformation industry 4.0, whatever buzzword you feel associated and connected with is there is no one size fits all recipe unlike some of the prior deployments like Six Sigma, right? It doesn't matter what industry you're part of, you have a, a defined recipe, DMAIC, it applies and no matter where you are, you go, you go follow that process and deliver results. In the digital world, when you think about you know, a, a Caterpillar-like company with 100 plus manufacturing locations that are all in different phases of their life cycle and digital transformation journey, there is no one size fits all. Someone might be working on analytics while someone might be working on visualization. Um, and so trying to give that, um, that consistent message to the different teams is pretty challenging. Uh, and then you, you weave on top of that, the complexity of having the right skills, the right priorities, the right grassroots organic interest and energy, the right top level leadership commitment. It's a pretty complex problem to solve. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's not been easy. That's, that's uh, the easiest way to answer uh, the high level question. But as you think about bringing it down to the working level, uh, the what's in it for me to, to Scott, your early comment about traceability and the big brother, right? We gotta, we gotta convince people um, and connect to their hearts and minds to we're trying to do this to make your lives easier, to make your lives simpler, safer, uh, a lot more enjoyable. And for those that have a natural knack to connect with you know, leveraging data to make more interesting decisions, uh, come on and join the team, jo join the movement, if you may. And, and it's been fun. You know, there are some people who are uh, somewhat dormant. Uh, they kind of do this tinkering on their own in the weekends and, and in their off time, personal time. And they've come out and say, you know, I can write this code and I can write this little uh, Java extension. I can make this happen. I can write this Visual Basic and there's a lot of organic interest in, in some of that. We just gotta be able to have the right mediums to tap into that interest, that excitement and start building the plane. Uh, while it's not just in flight, but it's, 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 um, it's taken off a long time ago and we're almost running out of fuel. Um, so we, we gotta get quick at doing this with a lot more energy and momentum from the, in, the entire, the extended organization, in my opinion. So thanks Alpen, I might just, I want to pitch that to Mark because you touched on something about, you know, people uh, being able to write a little code and come in and do stuff, which is awesome, right? For getting them involved, getting the hearts and minds. But there's also this concept that if you're going to really do digital transformation, you got to at some point start uh, killing the, the shadow IT systems or defunding those or making them part of other projects, things like that. And so, you know, I've been a part of little, visual basic projects that really needed to be defunded. And, and, you know, we, we find those all over. I remember Ethan, when we were helping you at Pfizer and we had to catalog back in the early days of 21 CFR part 11, which was electronics records and systems. I still remember the number of systems that Chris Sanders identified at your facility, which was 300 and some systems. And, and that was everything down to the Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that some, you know, buddy used in a lab, but it was a required, you know, it was required for part of the business. So it qualified as a system. So 
Mark, you might, you've seen a lot of uh, just uh, uh, systems. You might jump off where Alpin left off and just talk about how you capture those hearts and minds, enable those mobile workers and bring some of that new technology forward, but maybe not leave it in a stranded shadow IT environment. Yeah, what's, what's interesting uh, is, uh, I, let's face it, shadow IT and manufacturing plants exist because they are closer to it. And, and I don't know as if it's gonna go away, but I think we need to figure out how to tap into that. And you know, certainly they've got the subject matter expertise familiar with the systems and quite frankly, IT didn't, all right? And that's why they existed. Um, so I think it's really incumbent upon us to look at how we can tap into that expertise and use what we have. Uh, John made a great point is everybody's got a day job and, and some of this stuff is new and what can we do to free up people for this? And, and my contention is, is that there are certainly things that we can do to help free up people, but get us down the path of digital transformation. For example, you know, with I've had uh, actually a CEO at one of my customers said, I've done more to digitally transform in the last four months than I have in the last four years, all by using Teams or Zoom, all right? In this case, it was Teams, all right? So how can I make my people more productive by giving them some things to collaborate? How can I give them data that they can do their jobs more effectively? How can I maybe use that data to put crutches or things in place that can help lead them to the problem versus having them dig through what they need to find. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we can think of that can really address that freeing up issue of things. The other thing too, from a, from a the reality is that technology is uh, progressing so rapidly, all right? You know, even, even from four or five years, six years ago, when everybody was starting to look at IoT and what we could do there, the advancements, edge, cloud, 5G, artificial intelligence, all of these things kind of is like, boy, am I gonna be able to build up that expertise? And you, you candidly do need to do that, but you also need to look for ways that you can tap into third parties, educational systems as well. Um, and you know, I, I, I think you know, part of that equation is in that talent that you can tap into is a little bit of what, what Alpin said is, there's not really one size fits all in this thing. And you really need to think about it from an ecosystem, ecosystem perspective. Um, you know, hey, I, I'm sure everybody can appreciate the fact that we've got all different types of automation vendors in our plants, uh, all different types of MES systems from spreadsheets all the way to sophisticated uh, third party products. So uh, that's a, you know, a fact that we're gonna have to reckon with uh, uh, in, in, in building you know, our next generation of digital transformation. Yep. I'll, uh, since you said MES systems in all shapes and, and sizes, starting with the spreadsheet, I'll tell my, my only MES joke I have. The number one MES system on the planet is Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, MES. There you go. Dun -dun -dun <laughs> but it's true, Ouch. right? <laughs> it's absolutely true. So, Ethan, uh, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about Cloud. I showed the reference model, the ISA 95 model, and it's kind of, you know, inside the four walls of the facility. You guys have got, uh, you know, pretty, your culture is pretty unique and then you guys are doing everything from investing in software companies to, to producing this umbrella product. Um, maybe talk a little bit about this transformation as it pertains to moving to the cloud and maybe some of what you've done there. And also just the idea of manufacturers you know, having the comfort and security to move to the cloud with some of their manufacturing data. Yeah, uh, so um, we we did have a lot on the go and I was trying to pick, well, you know, what, what would be good to talk about? And I thought this cloud initiative that we take was probably most relevant for people. And it was certainly the most impactful within our organization. And uh, what we were running up against, what, what I, uh, talk to a lot of uh, my users about was um, if you kind of one way to kind of think about ERP systems in a life cycle and we have a maturing ERP system is that uh, you start to see the IT people becoming much more broad and, and deeper in that technology and the, and the users are much more shallow and narrower and what 
my experience has been is that uh, you'll get higher level executives that have a harder time answering the questions. I say executives or administrative or whatever the the staff people answering the questions in an ear because they can't get at the data in the ERP system. They're just, you know, they've moved around, they don't understand it. So um, part of that is because a lot of the native ERP systems are just their database table structures and heart, you know, they got weird names, you can't get at them and talk. So um, that doesn't mean though that you gotta go replace the ERP system, even though it's taken a bad hit from the top level people who make decisions to replace it. So we, um, we just started an initiative basically was was building out a data lake um, and we chose uh, Microsoft Azure's platform to build that data lake and then expose uh, our manufacturing data and our financial. So we had two different models, manufacturing and financial, uh, but really at the plant floor, they have much better tools today. And this was about a year's work to, uh, we got, we made a lot of progress in four months and then you got to hone it up, you know, and then let's just keep um, whittling on it. But uh, just a lot of exposure through the cloud on that. And I think uh, the cloud, you know, you, you've got to treat it like your internal data center, um, take some of the same security precautions that you do on your data center that you just can't go out there and stand it up and assume that it's protected. You have to have people that understand that technology. But um, as we, as, as I look at, for me, a data center, we're hybrid. We just upgraded our data center, but we still have the cloud. There are, to me, in, in my business cases, we come up against there's legacy systems that make more sense to run on-prem, but there are workloads that if you don't take advantage of them in the cloud, you can't run them. And so what we're doing with uh, the data lake with Power BI over the top of that, um, it's just incredible the exposure that people have at their data that they did not have before. Sometimes we hear that referred to as like self-service BI or some of the power users. Um, so, so Ethan, what, what real tools do those users have in front of them? Is it Power BI? Is it reports? Is it, you know, are they bolting in Excel to get that? Or how are they becoming more useful with the data lake? It's Power BI. Um, they, previous to that, it was Excel. We had some dashboards. We had reports. Those st still serve, you know, reporting still serves a function. I think Power BI will re replace the dashboards that we had. And then Power BI really um, has done a lot to eliminate the Excel spreadsheets because we, the users are building their own reports in BI. Um, it, it's friendly enough once we were able to establish the model that they could use BI to get to the, the data that they need to get to. Yeah, cool. So let me uh, flip slides here and just get the panel's input. And, and I guess give me a small logistics uh, comment here. It's 1230. I know we've had this on the schedule for 12 to 130. I think that was kind of our prep and hold time. We likely won't go too much past one o'clock for everybody's uh, lunch hour. So uh, we but we do want to save time for the audience to ask some questions. So a uh, little bit of logistics there. So um, as we talked about capturing the hearts and minds of people, this is a Microsoft slide on forces at work driving change in manufacturing. And I, I've been saying for a little while, you know, all of our, our information workers, our shop floor workers, they all have these really smart computers in their pockets now. And they walk in to, the, to these plants, which are, you know, pretty highly technical plants, but they usually keep that thing in their pocket and aren't using a lot of uh, mobile technology inside the four walls of a plant. So um, I know, Mark, you talked a little bit about, you know, that enablement of, of people uh, through through any sort of mobile experience or other, right? And I just wonder if anybody wants to comment on the, these forces and, and maybe in particular capturing the hearts and minds. And John, to your point, taking the load off the frontline worker so they can be freed up to do other things. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think also, Scott, probably something that play here is the need for 
continued evolution in technology. So specifically for manufacturers, where there is already a lot of um, um, you know activity being done by hands, there, there's not really this kind of availability for us to pull out a mobile mobile device. Although a couple of years ago that was massively um, advantageous because we were like oh my god i don't have to bring a laptop out here this is brilliant you know but, but the technology wasn't really available on the mobile platforms now the technology is getting available to mobile platforms and our user base or our manufacturers are demanding more what they're demanding is very much along the lines of if anybody's ever read the, the invisible computer which is absolutely brilliant book written in the 80s and it talks about the device is becoming intelligent where technology fades into the background and you just carry on about your business and interactions with the technology happen in a more organic and natural way. I very much see the need for technology to now evolve to that level for manufacturing. So you have an engagement layer where yes, traditional MES and ERP are still running in the backbone, uh, but at the same time, that background technology is not invasive to the process. I can do my manufacturing process as I see fit and the technology works for me and the data is just collected and is available. It's not, I need to go to a computer or I need to pull out a mobile device. It's the data is collected as a result of my activity. That's really what, what uh, to really get us to that next level of industry 4.0 is what needs to happen. Hey, can I jump in on that, Scott? It's your slide, Mark. Well, actually, what's what I when I was reading this, I'm like, hey, 90 percent of supply chain fulfillment will be cloud based by 2019. I wonder how many people in the audience agree with that. Um, I say we probably aren't quite 90 percent based on my assessment. But uh, here's here's what's interesting. Uh, John brings up some interesting uh, points and, and we, we've been referring to the thought of putting technology in the background in terms of what we kind of call ambient computing. All right, so, so I walk in a room and my lights go on, all right? The, shouldn't our technology kind of be the similar way? All right, I walk into a room, my thermostat goes up because I know what my temperature is and I've got the artificial intelligence and history information and I choose my preferences and the system automatically knows these things for me. We're starting to see a little bit of that all right, in terms of mixed reality. And there's a ton of technology out there uh, that kind of blends into this. That's really starting to blend the physical world with the, uh, the virtual world, meaning the IT data that might be underneath that, that can help people do their jobs. Whether it's looking at an asset or a machine in order to fix it, whether it's operating effectively and what do I need in order to do, perhaps even on the HMI interface um, in order to do that. So uh, it's, uh, we're starting to see some of that turn the corner, but uh, we still have a long way to go on that. Yeah, many of you uh, will know Jason Toshlog. He's our VP of products, and and he uses a term that you know really where we're headed is we're focusing on solutions that maybe may either make the human smarter and more capable, or that ambient computing, or make the building or infrastructure in this case maybe the machine smarter. Mark, what I heard you say, you know, that mixed reality is it, it's it's really a combination of both, and we need to be thinking about both of those. I know, John, some of the projects we've been talking about are, are both enabling the human to, to ease their burden of work instructions or whatever, but we might also need to make the, the process smarter, right? To just like you said, collect the data without us even knowing it's happening and it automatically becomes part of that digital record, right? Scott, if I may chime in, we, we should not ever underestimate the the connection and the acceptance of digital in the lives of those that are on the front lines. And one of the things that we've realized is as we look at OEE and performance and machine availability as kind of the key first level metrics that everyone thinks of when they start thinking digital is it, it turns out to be a kind of a poking in the eye phenomenon where you know, the digital team might be poking the operations team in the eye by telling them, Hey, you should be running, you know, at the rate of 50 pieces an hour. Why are you only running 35? And and the emotion is, yeah, you're you're picking on my people. And then we we look at the the next rung, which is availability, and then we pick on the maintenance team. And so what we've kind of designed our journey around is let's pick on something that 
symbolic, you know, is symbolic of who we are. And I think most people can recognize Caterpillar and quality are kind of one and the same. And so we've crossed the entire organization with the, the, the playing field of quality because quality is everyone's game. And it's no longer pick and, and poke and, you know, operations or the planning group or the maintenance group. Everyone is, is in the game on quality. And so we've taken that theme and making it, and making it the number one metric that we're gonna use digital to help us is improving our quality. And with quality comes waste and all the other forms that of, of inefficiencies. And it's, it's so much easier to get people excited about improving quality than it is improving you know, rate hours or pieces per hour or improving availability from 82% to 86%. But quality is someone something that everyone can get behind and has gotten behind for us. And so we're getting that organic kind of excitement around a cause that, that's common and it's everyone's um, and it's, it's our purpose. It's what we are, it's what we are known for. I don't think anyone would uh, relate Caterpillar to, hey, best number of uh, pieces per hour, but they can relate to Caterpillar equals quality. So it, it makes it easier in my opinion, in our experience as well. So Alvin, you, you touched on it, you know, and lots of times we talk about these big, uh, you know, my lead in sentences there, these are big, hard projects. And we talked about capturing the hearts and minds. And, it, you know, I, I, where I want to jump to is sort of executive sponsorship and leadership. Um, just had a conversation with a key employee here this morning about really getting to the vision and our why. And, you know, when we ask people to do more things like, John, you know, to free up to have more time and cycles to do, you know, other things, you know, we're still, we, we, are asking more of them, right. For the, for the immediate future. How have you guys seen uh, projects kicked off answering that why question, setting the vision? How have you seen that play out in some real projects? Yeah. If you'd like me to, to yeah, try to tackle that please. one, it's not been easy. As John alluded to early on, right, this is incremental work at the moment, um, and and our approach has been exactly that: recognizing and making it clear that we know and we appreciate the fact that it's incremental work, and we try to time fence it. You know, saying hey, we're going to try to collect this data on uh, the burden of your shoulders for the next X number of hours or X number of cycles, and it's our commitment to you to do something with that data. And so have that little handshake between um, those that were, uh, that were impacted uh, and impacting with incremental work but, and give them the, the so what of this incremental work is, is intended to drive this decrease in work that you're doing today minus uh, X percent. And of course, it, it helps that we are able to demonstrate that. So if we had promised you know, a 25% reduction in data collection, and we achieved 22%, we're now having another dialogue versus promising a 25% or committing to a 25% and achieving a 2%, then we gotta go back to the drawing board and try it one more time. So, you know, building that credibility and showing the value to the individual of what's in it for them, not for us folks in the office who are dreaming these things on whiteboards and in PowerPoint presentations, but how does it really manifest? And then connecting, you know, zooming into their lives and then just zooming out to the, the big picture of the company. What does that do to our bottom line? And what does that do in the next quarter, the next uh, year for the guys beside you and in front of you on another shift or behind you on another shift? And then, and then start to get, you know, more and more excitement around, yes, I believe in this and I can socialize to my peers uh, when, I, when I have a, a coffee break or when I sit down uh, at the lunch tables. I can start becoming the advocate that we don't even know of uh, because, because we've made their lives better. So it, it's, it's simple, uh, but it takes a lot of labor and it takes a lot of good, passionate handholding to, to get people to, to see the value, um, the real value, not just the value on PowerPoint slides. Alpin, have you found when you're having that conversation and kind of setting the vision and promising the, you know, the, the time bound um, requ request, are you finding that, that it's helpful if that comes from some of the higher level leadership in the organization or can it come from, you know, your, your project leadership and digital transformation leadership that you might be leading or is it, a, is it both? 
I think it's in our in our um, experience, it's both. We we at the at the higher levels maybe help set the stage, set the vision, uh, but we've been very very careful in creating kind of a, a middle layer um, change agent team. They might have not seen all the bells whistles results, but they connect to the vision, right? They're all smartphone users and pretty savvy at it, and they have a good rapport, right? So they are the natural catalysts and the natural leaders that folks look up to and believe. Uh, so we've been very careful in selecting those vital few, if you may, that, that become uh, the, the eyes, ears, and the hands on the factory floor that, that help convey the message uh, with some credibility. Because uh, you know, us office folks don't have uh, the same amount of credibility as those that are in the, tr in the trenches and the front lines every day do. So we're leveraging that as well. Cool. Yeah, Scott, I'd, I'd say just mine, mine would be a little bit of a mixed mixed uh, bag here because um, unfortunately, a lot of the uh, the the I guess uh, positioning of a lot of these initiatives is very abstract. It's very conceptual. Digital transformation, Industry 4.0, right? And it becomes very much a sales pitch at the executive level that, that, yeah, we buy into it, we love it, but we don't really know what it is, right? And, and you see this pretty little light out in the distance. And you're like, oh, look at the pretty light. Yeah. MES, ERP integrated, it's gonna be beautiful, yeah. but it really is a freight train coming your way and it's about to smack your workforce, yeah. right? You don't realize that this also requires clear product structure, very clean bill of material data. That means it's very, um, structured processes because you know yourself an MES system is the first to highlight any discrepancies in your process where you have some uh, hidden factory if you will right it'll bring that right up to the surface and it'll also highlight and uh, throw in your face any ambiguity in your process this is the thing that the the kind of buzzwords actually work against us because we paint this pretty picture but once you get into the transformational work, it, it is not Disneyland. I mean, it is a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of executive level, the executives are then pressured into making clear decisions that they weren't prepared to make, right? Do you realize we do X when we say we do Y? What do you want me to do about it? Very disruptive, right? So, so, so this is where I think some, sometimes the buzzword initiatives actually work uh, against us and prevent us from getting that executive buy-in because then they become gun shy, right? Yeah, I'm just, I love stories. And John, you're just reminding me of a story of a project we did for a customer and they they were a year and seven, 800 grand, probably close to a million into an MES launch. And they had a problem, they called a timeout. We weren't engaged at the time. They called us back as a consultant. And you know, one of their major things, you use the word hidden factory. One of their major things was they had this long-standing, pretty rich, customized SAP implementation. They were trying to implement MES, and they they didn't discover they didn't discover till this far in that all these hidden factory things that are in the notes fields of work orders, bill materials, and things like that don't translate very well as pure text into a downloaded order in the MES that you can go execute. You know, a label printer doesn't like reading a text field that says this should be printed on a four by six label, <laughs> right? And that's the kind of stuff that you deal with when you start closely coupling these systems. And like you said, that's not Disneyland, you know, that's, that's some really tough work. And, you know, the leadership of those types, types of projects has to understand that you're going to uncover things like that as you uh, try to standardize processes and make things easier and, and you know, put, Put this power in people's hands, right? Okay. Yeah. So I, I jumped to a slide. And I just wanted to. I'm going to switch gears. Um, watching the clock here, so I want to uh, pause here in just a second. But I want to switch gears and ask the team here um, a little bit about just basic connectivity. This is, I, I believe, uh, Mark. It might be another Microsoft slide, but it caught my eye because you got this concept of connectivity. Then you can start to kind of predict what's going to happen back that, you know, Alpine was talking about quality. 
And then you got this long-term thing where you can actually, you know, um, use some more of that for AI and kind of long-term decision planning and that type of thing. What I'm astounded at is Flexor has been in business 25 years. I've been in this industry 30 years and we are still helping clients put PLCs on ethernet and connect them up and get consistent communications and, um, you know, and, and clients are all in all different ranges of maturity, but maybe, uh, Mark, you could speak a little bit to where you're seeing clients in this uh, maturity model. Um, you know, are they play in with cognitive or they still got a lot of work to do in the connectivity area? I mean, just where are you finding clients investing time and where they really are today? Yeah, the, um, well, we, we actually find clients in all three of these phases, right? But, but where the bulk of a lot of people are today are early in the connect. And I think a lot of that goes back to uh, you know, we've talked a little about the contextualization of data uh, that we have and the challenge from coming from multiple siloed systems, whether, you know, just factor in, you know, your ERP and, and MES system, you know, the way that we tag things is very different. Uh, throw PLCs into the equation. You know, there's, there's this adage of think big, start small, but go fast. Um, and I'd add to that, fail fast uh, or fail and learn something from it. Um, the, you know, just a real quick story, Microsoft focused on getting connected first, you know, because uh, we knew that we could solve some very easy problems if we just surface data to more people, all right? Uh, and that kind of goes along with the, uh, you know, go fast uh, type of moniker. Um, it goes, uh, uh, you know, kind of goes with, um, you know, uh, get some easy wins uh, so that we can free up people uh, to do things. Um, we're well into the cognitive phase right now. We haven't fully gotten past the predictive phase, but once we've collected that information, we can do smarter things with it and we can do predictive things. I'll give you a classic example from COVID. Where's my stuff, all right? And can I, for example, build an algorithm that says, gee, we think that COVID or a weather problem is gonna hit this particular location in the next 24 hours, we have a load in that location. What, what can we do in order to uh, widen the window for us to make a smarter decision? All right? uh, you can th certainly think about predictive maintenance and, you know, hey, if I can take a, a window of, of going from literally, hey, my machine's broke to in three days, my machine's gonna break, uh, I can make some very smart decisions on how to run my operation. Um, in the cognitive piece, uh, this is kind of where artificial intelligence comes in a lot more, all right? And, you know, we, I just, you know, John talked about, you know, the technology just works and this notion of ambient uh, computing or ambient intelligence uh, that, uh, you know, surfaces information for people uh, ahead of time. Uh, so uh, the majority of manufacturers we see are in the connected phase, but let me just kind of give an example. And I think Alpen hit on something that we've seen um, kind of fascinating driving artificial intelligence. And that's the aspect of quality, all right? Yeah, we can rally everybody around quality. And that to me is a, a great place to think about predictive and cognitive. And quite frankly, if we can, you know, reduce, uh, you know, errors in, in production, we've got a really big, in some cases, we have a really big opportunity to return some value to the organization. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, those clearly are further down the path when you look at this uh, uh, spectrum of, of what you can do short term, mid term and long term. But also, John kind of mentions, you know, the 80 20 rule. All right. Where's the biggest rock that we can focus on? Yep. Good yeah. stuff. Just a further. Further to that, Scott, I do just just a quick one is that um, I I read an article in the the, the uh, Business Harvard uh, review there that says uh, you know a lot of organizations are dumping money into um, uh, being a data driven organization, right? And what does that really mean? But they've been doing it for ten years, and and they've surveyed these companies and said very few of them have actually moved the needle. And why is that? Because technology advancements have been massive right, exactly as what's been being portrayed on the screen right now, um, the technology is there. And I think there's two elements that are misunderstood in this space. One is, in order to enable the technology to work properly to where you can trust the data, you have to understand your data. And I know that um, 
you know, there was one comment earlier about, well, you know, looking at an old school ERP, not everybody understands it and, and whatnot. So that's the first thing. First step is just understanding your data. But the second is very much cultural. In the same article, it, they, they had a brilliant quote. It says, um, culture eats, eats strategy for breakfast. And I thought it was brilliant because what is shown on the screen is strategic and absolutely makes sense. But what happens when you get the result is all about culture. So getting the entire organization aligned to when you have an exclamation point, when something is telling you something is wrong, what is your reaction to it? What is the expected reaction and who's accountable to that? i just give you a quick uh, story in a previous organization that I worked with. SPC was all the rage. We've got to put in SPC. And they put in tons and tons of rules that didn't have justification because they weren't engineering limits. They were just like, hey, let's make sure we don't trend on temperature and speed. Well, they put all those rules in. And then eventually we started getting all these SPC violations. And the operator was, what do I do? No one told me how to respond to these SPC violations. So we wanted all this fanciness to tell us something might be going awry with no concept of how to actually resolve the issue. And I think, Scott, your team was actually engaged on this particular organization I'm referring to. And, and, and there just has to be a broader strategy there, right? There has to be a culture of accountability that comes with that strategy. Yeah, John, you reminded me, it's probably 15 years ago, but I remember selling an OEE, or back then it was called manufacturing intelligence before we started giving it OEE terms and stuff. But I remember the customer saying, I would love to do this project. We have justification for this project. We're not going to do this project because we know ourselves and we know if we put it in and it's screaming at us, we don't have the culture, the, the strategy, the policy, you know, procedures in place to go actually address it. Right. So if it's the exclamation point, if it's the beep, the text, whatever it was, we just, we're not, we know we don't have the maturity as an organization to go do it. So we're not going to spend the money. And I'm like, kudos to you guys. You know, I mean, a little sad we didn't get to do the work, but totally understand the the justification to pause so hey why don't we it's five to one i'd love uh if there's anybody in the audience that has questions um uh if you want to throw them in the chat that'd be great we've got 47 people on the call so i don't know that it's wise just open up microphones and start asking questions so if you have a question for the panel throw it in the chat and we'll just take them as they come in and if nothing comes in immediately, um, I'll, I'll throw out a couple more to keep it rolling here for a few more minutes. I saw Lee uh, commented on, yeah, culture each, it's, it's, I've heard both culture each strategy for breakfast and I've heard it culture each strategy for lunch, but either way, it, you know, culture Trump strategy, right? <laughs> exactly. So I have, um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, I'm going to, I'm going to get in the right deck here and I'm going to say, I'm going to go here. So this is a, a little bit of a genericized um, uh, slide, John, that you presented, but it made me ask, I want to ask a question of people um, about sort of the, the digital taxonomy or what you guys think are some of the core pieces of solutions that, so I call these monuments. Um, and this is where, you know, everybody's going to have monuments that aren't going to go away anytime soon. It's your ERP system. It's, you know, in, your, in this case, you know, product lifecycle management. So, and, and I'll, I'll dovetail this with another comment that was in the Sloan paper. Manufacturers believe in continuous improvement. Digital companies, in contrast, uh, 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 digital companies in constant innovation. So this concept of these monuments that are built in granite that never leave and they have 20 and 30 year life cycles versus that constant innovation. I'm just curious what, what you guys think are a few key pillars that are always gonna be there, but where some of these microservices and cloud hybrid stuff and things like that might start filling in some of the gaps. Ethan, you have a comment? You've been quiet for a while. Um. I would say at a plant floor level, um, I don't know that I figured out how to get around building materials, items, routes, structures, you know, that order to cash process is there, right? And so 
then you start getting into how detailed is that uh, john hit on some of the challenges around the data specifically to that i think sometimes data challenges come into you know an erp to support the manufacturing and you can put all kinds of rules in place that they get the data right so you know they don't measure more coming out than the went into this but but if you lock it down too tight then uh then then you stop operations in the middle of the night, you know, so you come in and clean up the data in the morning, but that, that data is there. And if you can get that richness of that data there, it's it, a populate for us. There was just a wealth of data sitting in our ERP that nobody was mining because it was too hard. So I think what, what changes for, for me at a manufacturing level, what I see is more opportunity to, um, more easily populate that data, whether it's IoT, that sort of thing. But there's a core system there, right? And I don't know that if you've got a team that can support your ERP, you know, and I'm, I'm, I always feel like replacing the ERP, you just shouldn't do any ROI on it, nothing. Everybody in the organization has got to feel in the pit of their stomach that this thing's so bad that we're ready to replace it, you know, and that's the only justification. Otherwise, people would be barking about that. So then, how can you enhance the experience for the people that don't like it? And that, that comes to the tools today, I think, that um, are available that I, I think stuck in that when we look at that cognitive state, we've been stuck in it. But I don't know that we've really had great tools to date. Data warehousing concepts have been around forever. And some, in some respects, the data lake is a data warehousing, but it's much different now. You know, it's much more easy and the Power BI is more user friendly and if you structure the models correctly, I've just seen a lot more uptake in that than I have seen in past efforts around any uh, data warehousing reporting solution. Yeah, good. I know I launched a fairly big question out there about yeah. monuments and pillars and, and systems. Thanks, Ethan, for tackling that one. I got a couple questions that came in um that uh, i think i want to pitch to the team one the first ones is how are your companies managing the people roles of it and ot convergence and i would say i'm going to address that because oftentimes uh, when we go talk to customers and they're launching off on some of these digital transformation projects and they don't have the right resources to to maintain those solutions or come alongside us and and do some knowledge transfer. You know, we, we say out loud, we are not doing these projects for job security. We're not building these things so that we have to be the ones you call back all the time. Um, we, we want you to be able to own them. The fact is though, you have to, this is not a traditional skill set. So this is not, you're not gonna take somebody just purely out of your IT group that might be doing infrastructure, networking or reports and magically put them in this ITOT convergence area. Now you can obviously train people and augment and, and add people in, but there, there's a pretty special niche here that understands everything from operations and quality to IT and manufacturing engineering. And, and that is a pretty unique space as we talk about digital transformation within manufacturing. So we're encouraging customers to hire for that, stand up those kinds of hybrid teams um, and, you know, as you tackle, as we've talked about during this panel, tackle those projects for success that you have the support of kind of a hybrid or, or cross um, capable team to do that. So I don't know if any of the other panelists would chime in on that question about IT OT convergence. Hey, I, I can. I, you know, we've talked a little bit about culture and leadership in this, and I think that's an aspect of this, this particular question. Um, we're seeing more IT folks saying, how can I get a seat at the boardroom, right? And, and to me, that comes down to, well, what value are you providing uh, based off of the business objectives of the organization? So we, we've seen org, uh, IT organizations flip a little uh, and say, you know, and, and quite frankly, in manufacturing, IT in some cases seen as a cost center only uh, and not a real value driver uh, and uh, more, IT staff have said, well, how can we embed ourselves into the business more, all right? Um, so, you know, it, it's gonna take leadership in order to do that and a little bit of a culture change to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know as if the 
the function of you know IT and OT and the the operations, but certainly the blending of that, and that is a unique skill set in order to be able to accomplish that. And just uh, one comment that or one learning that occurred to me that I think value. I see it kind of in the uh, in the questions here, but my experience of going from a Pfizer very large scale organization to a mid size and then in smaller size even have more of a challenge right but when i was at pfizer from a technology standpoint if i had a question you could generally find someone doing what you had a question about within the organization then going to a mid size it's more outside the organization that you have to seek answers so the network you build around you as a smaller team outside your organization is um, much more critical than what it is in a large organization. So when I look at our like our digital transformation, it I, I see the the question for me is, hey, is is that a talent that we bring into our organization, we invest in, and how quickly would someone pull them away from our organization, and we got to go back and replace them? So there's key components of what we've done in our Azure environment. Uh, with Databricks and that sort of thing where we've had to rely on partners. And I said, you know what, that partner's in that game for the entire run, their business, they focus on that. And if I bring it in house, I, I can't train them up. I don't have the skills to train them up. And if they leave, it's just gonna be a continuous cycle. So it, it's building a network around you with those IT people that um, is really important for me in the industry size I am. Ethan, you're, uh, you're, you guys are all probably reading the questions and you're starting to dovetail on Todd's question about the demand for engineering and IT talent outstripping the U.S. supply and, and how do you suggest it, uh, suggest solving it. Um, I'll just say from a service provider standpoint, we're seeing that. We've been seeing it for a while. There's something that just happened in the first quarter of this year that we're seeing it incredibly difficult right now. Um, I'm, we're using terms like the war on talent, um, you know, to your point, uh, people are moving around some Ethan and, and get stripped away. Um, we're, we're seeing some of that. Um, so it's, it is a challenge. And I think, uh, our STEM, uh, production of STEM engineers, particularly female STEM engineers and, and software developers, we'd love to see all that amped up, um, as well as even just, um, uh, immigration type reform you know we, we struggle to have if we have a great talent that needs sponsorship visa sponsorship um, i don't want to get political but that you know that is a very very difficult process uh to get through so i'm just curious if anybody has any comments on that talent question yeah it, it is uh it is real right there is a shortage of talent uh the talent requirements and expectations are shifting by the day as new technologies are being developed and new case studies are being published. Um, we're, we are just like the best time to plant the tree was either 75 years ago or today. So today is today and we just got to start working um, with, with whatever resources we have access to within the family. And of course, then tapping into the academic partners that we have for us blessed or Purdue is three miles away. So we are tapping into that a great juggernaut of a, of a university. But one thing that we've also noticed is uh, the ability to do internal crowdsourcing. So, you know, putting the feelers out to those that have, uh, I, I kind of talked about earlier, a natural knack to do this kind of work. And, and one thing that was really revol revolutionary for us is when we started our journey in additive, I know we're veering off the topic just a tad bit, when, when we started additive and we put kind of a feeler out to who wants to be a part of this team, we found at our facility alone more than 50 hobby additive manufacturers who do this, some for hobbies, some for a living outside of the work here at Caterpillar. And so we were, I mean, we were surprised, but we were already off to a great start not having to reinvent some of the, the wheel that they had done on their own. And so we're finding that within the digital transformation piece as well, as you know, folks have some inherent talent and some interest to help bridge the gap. And then they, they might not be the right people to take care of the job, 
but they can lend a hand in creating a training package uh, or the upskilling package with a few skills that might be lacking from, from a few individuals that can help close those small gaps and then, and then help build that momentum. So we're trying both ways. It's not easy. Uh, um, the other thing that's unique for us is we, Caterpillar, have a pretty tremendous offering to the marketplace with our yellow machines and, and engines to our customers. And we've been doing, you know, going back to the prior slide, we've been doing cognitive work for our customers for a number of years now. We've accumulated more than, I can't remember what the number is, but I think more, more than a several million miles of autonomous hauling in mine sites. And that's all the power of cognitive, right? AI, ML at, at its finest. So we're leveraging a little bit of that skill set that we have within the CAT family to focus maybe a little bit more inwards into the factories where we create the machines that get embedded with all this special software and, and understanding, you know, what's the scalability of some of the work that's been done on CAT machine to within CAT factories. And it's been an interesting journey because a lot of the, the customer expectations are very different than what CAT expectations are within the four walls of the factory. So it's been, it's been a unique learning relative to data scientists and, and those that interact with ethernet and PLC and AB controls and whatnot. Um, but I'm gonna say it's not easy. It's been very, very <laughs> difficult. In the market that we're in, especially where we are in the state of Indiana, everyone's competing for the same scarce talent. So if anyone yeah. has anyone that they're they're not utilizing, send them my way. I'll find them a job for life. Hey, 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 Alpin, I'm hosting this thing, man. Send them our <laughs> way first. So I'm having a little bit of mind blown uh, revelation here. You know, we talk about autonomous vehicles, and we we you know we hear about the uh, some of the semis and, and dedicated lanes are going to be some of the first autonomous vehicles, you know, on, on highways and stuff. But did I hear you say you're logging several, you know, like millions of miles of autonomous hauling and mine operation, mining operations? That is correct. That is correct. That's mind blowing. Like it, that, that makes total sense, right? It's quote unquote safer. At that, least from that, that, you know, is, that is the people. rally cry. Our customers gave us the rally cry of safety was the yeah. initiative they all got behind is we want to get our people and especially in the underground mining space we want to get our people out of the cabs of these trucks because we don't know when something bad is going to happen and yeah. and it, it was something wow. that that we we took on and not only are we doing it for our machines we're doing it for competitor machines because it's the right thing to do yeah very cool that, that's a really dovetail, a great dovetail into Alexander's question on here about the industry being ready for closed loop decision making from cloud based models. Um, and especially when you think about those intelligent uh, products, like you're talking about Alpin that, you know, out in the field outside the four walls. And then, you know, we have you, you reference PLC automation and machines inside the four walls. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to throw my opinion out there. I think it depends on uh, what it is you're making and the type of environment. I mean, if you have a large machining center at Caterpillar and Lafayette, you know, that, that's going to be controlled locally right there with some, some pretty, you know, a cabinet that's bolted to the machine. You know, if you have more of a kitting operation or something that's, uh, you know, from a safety perspective, may not uh, require that uh, closely coupled and deterministic automation that could lend itself to that. We're seeing uh, our customers back to this connected uh, piece um, you know, we were joking around yesterday, you know, we, we, in our customer base, sometimes we have people that want to put the, you know, put it on, put the solution on a laptop that's sitting out there underneath the conveyor or in a cabinet that's nearby the equipment. And we're seeing that change dramatically, uh, at least going into an industrial data center or something that's uh, a better physical environment for that equipment. Um, and in some cases, uh, feeling comfortable enough with the, you know, the wide area network. Um, and the connectivity back to it, an off off-site data center it could be a private cloud or you know something inside still within their uh, you know their their uh, processing data centers. But um, and we even have a few that have put them in more of a public uh, cloud environment. And uh, now the question I think Alexander's at you know closed loop in some areas yes, but it's probably more information flow than 
automation or equipment, um, that type of thing. So I don't know if the panel has any comments on if we're ready for that yet. Well, I'll, I'll give you an opinion. I, I mean, it depends on what, well, how, how narrow or broad you want to think about the, the closed loop. Uh, there's there's some bits of technology uh, that uh, is is coming to the forefront in, in what's called deep reinforced learning uh, that can aid in the closed loop aspect of things. And if you just think about all the knobs and controls and variables that go into a, a processing line, how can I twist those knobs at any point in time using technology in order to create the perfect product. Um, we've done a couple of uh, pilot projects along those lines. I can get as simple as how do I recalibrate a CNC machine or how do I produce the perfect Cheeto, for example. Uh, you know, but uh, I don't know as if we're totally ready for there yet, but certainly there's some people that say, you know, hey, you know, PepsiCo wants to create the perfect Frito. Um, and they know that's a massive process and it requires a lot of people to do it. And they're looking at autonomous capabilities and in this closed loop notion in order to do that. So the, what, there's another great question on here. We touched on a little bit about leadership, chain, uh, you know, the why and vision, casting vision and support from executive sponsors, that type of thing. Um, does anybody have any change management strategies that you're using, have be used or successfully employed that you're dovetailing digital transformation projects in with those change management strategies or do you think they require their own new kind of uh, thinking and, and change management for specifically these types of, pro I mean, I love the internal crowdsourcing Alpin, but from a change management philosophy and strategy standpoint, anybody got anything formal going? I'll, I'll, I can try that. Um... So the formal piece is persistence, right? <laughs> never, never give up. Uh, but one, one of the things, and I think Mark, you might've said it earlier is, you know, the definition of digital transformation is so ambiguous. And as you think about having a conversation with five people, you'll get 14 opinions, depending on what context and where you are physically standing when you're having that conversation. So one of the things that we've tried quite hard is to break the myths around what does digital mean for the world? Where are you in the digital world already in your personal lives? And what does it mean to our endeavor here at the facility? And we started the, the conversation, it's very simple. We started with a, a mercury stick thermometer. Then we showed them a programmable thermostat. And then we showed them a picture of the nest. And we walked them through, they're all doing temperature control but what's being done and how the humans are interacting, right? Going back to the, therm the, the thermometer that had a mercury uh, stick, the human had to get out of their chair and adjust a knob. The programmable thermostat, right? You programmed it and then the system took over. The Nest is doing all the decision-making for you. I, I think you, Mark, might, you might've said it, right? When I enter the room, the temperature needs to be increased because it sensed me. And so we're bringing people along with that breaking it down to what we would consider, you know, lay and, and everyday life decision-making that's been given to, to computers and, and, and data processing units. And how does that pertain to us? Uh, and then we, we complement that conversation with uh, the risk profiles and, you know, false positives and false negatives and how do they, they, they relate to the world that we're living in and what primitive decision-making can we offer the computers to do for us? such as improve, increasing or decreasing the flow of coolant. It might not be a life-threatening situation, but if you change the feeds and speeds of, of a spindle going into a part or to a fixture, that could be life-threatening. And, and, and getting people to understand how we're building the model with you know, giving some primitive decision-making and then maybe enhancing that after we've gotten comfort with not so many po false positives and not so many false negatives and building a confidence and then giving more responsibility to, to where you know, the decision, the closed loop decision making can be done. And then letting the humans feel comfortable relinquishing a little bit of that control. Seeing, and we're not there yet, but we're, we're testing the waters to what, what do you feel comfortable? We, we've got you know, sensors turning on and turning off the lights in restrooms and offices and factories, turning on and turning off pumps um, uh, based on different times of the day did you even know that that was going on? And a lot of times it's like, oh, I didn't know that. 
yeah, it's happening. We're doing this today and we've actually been doing it for three years. Um, so it's warming that, that kind of, um, you, your toes already been dipped in the water. Let me tell you that it's been there and the water's not so cold. The water's actually pretty nice and comfortable. So, you know, putting more of your body into it, it's not gonna be very harmful and very dangerous. Uh, it's kind of the approach we, we've used. And it's, it's been interesting, a, a lot of interesting discussion and feedback. Um, and then, and even on this COVID thing, we, we took advantage of what COVID brought to the landscape uh, and, and gave them uh, examples of how, you know, AI was using in our own factories, the validation of whether employees were using their masks in proper orientations or not. And it, it, it was mind blowing for people like, oh crap, we can do this? Yeah, we can, real time. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's showing by example, I think has been probably the biggest element of change management that's worked for us. I just uh, uh, jump in there on that one, Scott, that, that, you know, within the example I used with our, our new data model, um, one of the things we had to establish was a data governance uh, committee. And the issue was over years, you know, the, the, marketing referred to sales differently than planning referred to sales differently than finance referred to sales a field in the you know was that customer part of this marketing tier or that marketing tier and then uh, a sales line could mean we could have three different quantities on different sales items and that's where people got confused at looking at the data so uh, establishing governance around what those fields mean and everybody interprets them the same was a key key component to us managing the change through this yeah and I uh, yeah, yeah. Ethan you've been a part of a you, you'd mentioned it the very very large organization we have a business intelligence team that is helping a very large organization you know, a lot of their projects are that kind of data normalization so Database one calls machine one M1, database two calls machine one M01, and database three calls it machine O1, right? And it's all the same machine, um, but all of those systems have grown up over time with different, you know, so it's, it goes back to data governance. And I think part of this digital transformation is building those solutions right the first time or thinking about those things on the way in because that context, as Mark talked about earlier, you know, that's gonna be difficult to bolt all that back together if, it, if you have to go in there and wire up all the spaghetti every time you want an answer. And Scott, I think my approach, although I love Alpen's approach, is it's a very diplomatic and easygoing approach. Mine is a bit more abrasive, but it's because I need to mo move so many chips, so many mountains so quickly. My, my intent is I've got to harmonize people, process, and technology and people to understand their data, right? And I got to do it quick, but I need to do it globally. So literally, uh, um, kind of back to some earlier points, I'm setting the vision. Guys, this is what it can look like. But do not chase butterflies, guys. Don't get caught up in bells and whistles. We've got to get this done quickly. So I define the deployment strategy in which is going to alleviate that 80-20 rule, alleviate, excuse me, <clears throat> alleviate work as we go, do it quickly, and then you have laser-focused playbook mentality execution. Guys, rinse and repeat. Let's go department by department or whatever the case is. And, and what I have to do, what I have to get um, – the entire executive team to buy into is we have to burn the ships because it gets very scary when you get into this because when you move at that 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 rate of speed and that change that's coming it there's reluctancy to actually go all the way on board right and then you get into a situation where you got one foot on the dock and one on the boat the worst thing that i can do is make that a comfortable position oh well let me integrate back into legacy technology or fragmented solutions so that you can be comfortable as you're strat straddling the dock in the boat. No, I, I don't want to do that. I want to use that as incentive to get into the boat. So we've got to burn the ships, or, or what I like to say is burn the dock, <laughs> to, to force people to jump into the boat. And don't get focused on, on trying to get it perfect. The intent for me is to get it in a standardized fashion so everybody is doing it the same way. Then we can come back with an optimization phase 
And then after we've optimized and eliminated waste, we can come back and automate very much like an Oliver White type uh, methodology. Yeah, I think to your point, John, I mean, at some point we, we've even had that in our small internal business here and you know, we have to be willing, there's a date where we're shutting the system off and we're converting. That's it. It's, it's going to be shut off. Now we might leave the server in the closet, so to speak, for a couple of weeks or a couple of months until we, you know, be sure we don't need anything else off of it. But it's, it's, we're not using it anymore. You will not be able to log in. And I think that's these shadow IT systems and kind of like boat dock straddling, right? You have to do that. Yeah. So team, it's, it, we got just to that point. I know you, yeah, go ahead. So, sorry, sorry, Scott. I know you, I know you like stories, 30 seconds here. Um, I was working with an, uh, an organization who was trying to do cloud strategy for three years, just couldn't do it and whatnot. Finally, they hired a guy and in within six, six to nine months, I don't remember exactly what it is, everything's in the cloud. I said, man, how did you do it? He said, I sold the data center yeah. to your point, right? So sell the data, data center and then you got no choice. Apologies there. <laughs> to totally understand. We we're working with another major client right now and they're moving completely to the cloud outsourcing the, you know, the, their data center stuff. And they're, they're literally pulling the plug on their, their data center coming up, I think in June or something. This is a company who's been pretty close to the vest with a lot of IT and proprietary stuff. And so this is a major move to sell the data center to, to pull the plug. So well, team, I, this has been phenomenal, and you know, we'll have to talk after if, if there's a chance we could, if people, I wish I could pull the plug on the data center. <laughs> um, so it might have to do this again if, if uh, there's enough um, appetite for it. But uh, with a couple minutes left, I wonder if anybody just has any closing remarks. Uh, I know John and Alpin, you had some great sort of kind of tie-in uh, closing remarks there. Anything from anybody on the panel as we, as we close in on 1.30? You know, I'll just give you a, a last thought on the technology bits. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about skilling, shortage, and that sort of thing. The, I think one of the tricks is to look for technologies that can close that gap. Uh, today that there's actually, a lot of the vendors are focused on this, this notion of low code, no code. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, how do we close that gap? Well, we give the audience, make the audience bigger that can use some of these things. And, Low code, no code allows citizen developers, all right? And I've seen examples where uh, I had a welding operator uh, that said, hmm, let me take this home. And he built an application that can really help uh, his, his function in the manufacturing plant. And this is a, a tier two uh, supplier to, uh, actually a tier two supplier to CAT, believe it or not. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we widen the, the, and broaden the ability for more people to do and use technology, uh, that's ultimately going to help us uh, close that gap and uh, digitally transform a lot faster. So, uh, yeah, my, my closing comment following that, Mark, would be, you know, I had, uh, we have a new enterprise solutions team here. They're doing ERP implementations, power platform work. And I had them demonstrate power platform for me the other day in this concept of dataverse and power apps and all of the, the low code, no code stuff that's behind the scenes. If you have Office 365 and you wanna get an idea what some of the stuff is, you might wanna open up some of these icons that most people don't ever use and take a look at what that is. I'm, it's another mind blowing thing for me to see uh, what, what low code, no code is going to be and, and those citizen developers. I don't, I don't even understand it yet, but I can see the power of it coming. And when I see the horsepower under the hood that's already there from Microsoft, it's, uh, it's going to be very interesting in the next few years. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. It's 126. Really appreciate the panel. Appreciate uh, we had 50 people on board for most of the, the time. So what a, a good time. We'll, uh, we'll circle the wagons later, see if we want to do some other ones similar to this, but really appreciate your time, everybody. Thanks a lot.